Well, I'm down here on a south coast, busy beach, summer beach, blazing hot. Luckily, I put some sun cream on before I left home and just giving it a go. Got a bit of a tip off from uh, Wayne on Wayne Combin and said there might be a chance on a beach down here um, where a guide caught some fish in the daytime. You never know, summer in the UK, well, it's rarity anyway, and let's face it. But I'm down here, I've got my rods out, I've got a uh, whole Atlantic peel prawn on one. Whacked out as far as I can get it. My fish are tied up, haven't had anything yet. And um, Wayne's been fishing with me as well. He just dives off to the shops. Um, I've got ragworm with a little, I'm going to call it a stinger hook, about a size six freshwater hook. Hoping a small fish would come for the big ragworm and or squid or prawn, nibble that away and then take a small hook. However, we haven't had any bites for small fish. We haven't even had crabs, to be honest. We have actually had an awful lot of weed. Now the tide, I'm nearly about an hour after high water now. They say after high water is not so good here. I'm just going to hang it out and see what happens. I've got a spinning rod. I bought the wrong spinning rod. And uh, it's actually a carp rod, so I've had to sort of cobble it together. And I've got uh, one of the Wackenoster rigs with small hooks. I think they're two O's blued on there. And the smallest pieces of ragworm I've got. I've only got ragworm. Two manky old squid from the other night where I was another virtual blank. I think a little bream saved me there. Um, and the Atlantic prawns which have been fishing previously, frozen, fishing, frozen, fishing, frozen. So not great quality. I went to buy some, paid for the car park, walked up, Iceland's shut. Oh great, you don't get your car park money back, do you? So it's a beautiful day. Got those sort of flattened off clouds there that uh, Intimate is high pressure, but it's very windy, which is probably just coming off the land. Loads of people on the beach. I've seen a couple of guys throw the rods out and just lay back sunbathing. So it's a catch anything, but no bites, but no bites. But you never know, might get lucky, might get lucky. And as if to rub salt into the wound of what was a slow day, just look offshore here, towards the Isle of Wight, a massive shoal of gulls, obviously working bait. Now listen, that could be mackerel, it could be mackerel working tiny sand or something like that. More likely to be bass, a school of bass working over a bank on again sand eel or white bait. And there's a boat just on the right there that's drifting away they're going to go into the... I can see by his arm going up and down that he's actually feathering. He's not casting a spinner. And if it's me, I'd be letting the boat drift down on the wind of the tide into the school, about there, bang in the middle of the screen, where the bulk of the words, birds are, and actually be casting a spinner or subsurface, or even maybe a surface plug there. But when I pull back on the zoom lens on this camera, you'll see it is actually a fairly substantial cast. I would only reach if I cracked off at 100 miles an hour. It's going to be windy guys, but just got lucky there, just past the top of the tide. Got a really nice bream there for the shore, look. That's a nice fish. And I was getting little tappy bites and I, I did some touch ledger and holding the braid. And there you go. Save the plate. That's a nice bream from the shore. I'll be catching these all day, I'll be happy. Let's get him off. Got his fin up as well, he's bound to spite me, bound to spite me. What a setting we've got. People on the beach, swimming, snorkeling, all having fun. And I'm having fun now. Great fish, let's get it back. I basically want to get the bait out again. It's hot, 
and the uh, heat takes it out of you, makes you more, more tired. A couple of guys came up and they said they had hounds, but all the better fishing is really at night. Uh, when you get the summer here, you don't catch too much during the day, but I've had hound, fish, hound baits out there. I mean, I've been in with a shout. The weed's not too bad, the tide's not too bad. It is what it is. But listen, there's so much of beach fishing, especially where I was talking with Wayne, that it's, it's just keep fishing and gain, gaining information all the time. You're fishing, talking to other anglers, gaining information. And that's really what it's all about. I know it's mostly night fishing in the summer, I realise that. <clears throat> but if you get big spring tides, a nice warm night, you should be with a shout. Of course, fish is not what it should be. But you beginners out there, you need to know what bait for what species, and especially along the south coast here. So I'm going to drop into Cosham Angling, because Wayne does a bit of part-time helping out there for him. He's going to run through, hopefully, some of the baits for the some of the different, you know, different species. Like, maybe I shouldn't be using whole Atlantic prawns here. It should be hardback crabs. It might be peeler crabs. I don't know. I don't live here. What you need is the information. Five-minute warning, guys, and we'll go and see him in the shop. Well, I'm back here. I've met Wayne. Don't look in the tackle shop. And we come to the most sensible place for sound. Honestly, believe me. It is the most sensible place, isn't it, Wayne, really? Yeah. It certainly is. Cheers. Cheers, Grant. Mmm. That's what I've got my stosh for, to soak up all the foam. Well, we tried to do a little talk in the pub. Nice place to do one, but it wasn't too noisy. So we've come down to the ECA. Much, much more uh, uh, relaxed atmosphere. It's a quiet afternoon, so... Yeah, we were talking about um, the shop I'm working in, what sort of kit you got there. And in all honesty, what's really surprised me is the, the sheer amount of, of hobby anglers or, or new anglers. And as you know, well, no, Graham has, has done lots of videos for you know people who want to come into the sport. Um, and you don't sort of realise just how many there are. There's there's a huge amount. So yeah, you know, we have a little talk about what sort of kit we've got. Um, what sort of uh, <laughs> is that? Why it's a boat going past? Yeah, but at least it's a boat, Wayne. Yes. Well, there's someone. Uh, Dropping a beer glass. This is the spot to talk fishing anyway. <laughs> That's right, it is. Yeah, but anyway, going back to what we were saying, um, if you're a beginner, and this is who we're aiming most of this at, is, is beginners, uh, you can't really go wrong. Buy yourself a nice little cheap setup, plenty available. You know, you can go online, you can pop into the shop, have a chat with uh, anybody who, who works in a tackle shop, should be able to put you in the right direction. Um, shouldn't cost the earth. A good way to start if you're um, getting into fishing is to buy a set of feathers. Now you don't really want the great big ones, you can buy the, the huge chicken feathers and the, the big white plastic ones. My advice would be get the little tiny sabikis, so not the quite the sand hill ones which are really small, but the, the small ones in between that. Very small feathers is what you're after. Um, a really good idea, tip them. Tip them with a little bit of bait, a little bit of worm, a little bit of squid, really helps that does. And if you're starting fishing, buy yourself a set of feathers, small ones, quarter pound of worm, a couple of smaller four ounce leads, check the tides. If you're going anywhere around the beaches and that lot, you don't want massive tides because all that'll happen is um, it'll, it'll just whip that all away. You want to sort of choose a fairly small tide for where you're fishing and um, find some structure. Piers, piers are, are fabulous. Loads of fish around piers. And um, it's just a nice cheap way to get into fishing. I say you can buy a a nice outfit from, from a, either from a tackle shop, ask their advice, always ask their advice. Um, what sort of line way do you say put on a cheap outfit for kids? And well, most people when they beach fish don't use much more than a 20 pound line for their main line. What you will need to do is put on a, a, a shock leader. Now, basically, if you don't know what a shock leader is, and don't forget, when, when you were talking, experienced anglers know all this, but, but beginners don't, so this is who we're, we're aiming at. Now, the, the shock leader basically is a heavier line. Now I use, say, a couple of rod lengths. Um, so basically I've got, say, a couple of turns on my reel. Um, enough line to go down your rod and then the same again, say. And it's a heavier line that you tie to your main line. There's, there's a few knots you can choose. I won't go through them now. You can look online for those. Um, you want something small so it travels through the, the, the rings easy. Um, and the general rule of thumb is, for every ounce of lead you, you're going to cast, you want ten pound of a shock leader. So if you say, for instance, using a four ounce lead, if you're just giving it a gentle flick, it's not so 
important, but even with that, you can snap 20 pound lime with a four ounce lead. If you're using four ounce lead, you want to use 40 pound shock leader. So it's for every ounce of lead, 10 pound of lime. It's easy to remember, five ounces of lead, 50 pound shock leader, so on and so forth. You can use grip leads, which will help you nail your bait to the bottom a little bit easier. Um, again, you know, th these sort of things, it depends where you're fishing, check online, see what the tide is, and that'll tell you what sort of weight you're gonna need. As well as the smaller fish around piers and, and wrasse and the like, um, and, and obviously mackerel, we, there's plenty of bigger fish around. You know, we've got a, a nice population of bream along the south coast at the moment. As I speak, it's late July. Um, there's rays and smooth hounds about, there's taupe about. Um, if you're gonna try for taupe, you need, will need a, a thicker trace because they are, their teeth do not mess about. Um, I'll show you they don't, if, if you get that in there, <laughs> that was me got caught by a taupe the other day and uh my badge of honor badge of honor yeah yeah my own silly fault all in big sharks a, a tote gets me but um yeah there's, there's all along the south coast you've got where we are we're at Eastney, which is portsmouth um across the way there you've got hailing island we're on portsea island here but all the way along the south coast from say selsey all the way along bracklesham um you've got hailing beach you've got east stoke beach here further up South Sea, and then obviously you go further along, you've got the, the opposite, the, the, you've got the New Forest Limington if you want to go around that area. There's some really interesting fishing uh, from the shore around all those marks, and big stingrays, some, some lovely big stingrays have come out this time of year. Again, be careful with them, they do not mess about. I, I saw a guy got copped on the hand last year, made that look like what it is, a scratch. Um, it was bad, the, the bloke passed out three times, and if you'd have seen the wound, you wouldn't have blamed him for it. It was pretty nasty. So, um, but if you want to target those fish, you can use the same gear. You know, the same, uh, the, say, a, a six thousand five hundred size multiplier, um, twenty pound main line, and you just change your rig slightly. So, you want a slightly heavier uh, a rig for for a ray, say, or a hound. Um, I would personally, I wouldn't use anything lighter than about forty pound trace line for that for those fish. Personally, I might even go a bit heavier. Hook sizes, you can get them on, you can get all these fish on, you don't have to go huge. I mean, the fish will get a decent size hook in their mouths, believe it or not. Um, there's a couple of things about that. I would personally go strong hook, nice, say 4.0. Um, you can even go small, you can probably go 3.0 if you go look at a really strong pattern, like a, a meat hook pattern. Um, and that, that they won't break, they won't straighten, straighten out on a, on a a, a good smooth round or a good ray. You can't beat crab for smooth round, you, you really can't. Um, you, you, a lot of tackle shops sell them. Um, you can go and collect them yourself, but you cannot beat crab for, for hounds. They really, you don't seem to get much else on crab, oddly enough. Considering you open a lot of fish up, they've got crabs in them. You know, in the winter, you know, if every cod we've ever cleaned has had crab in the stomach, but you put a crab down, and well, I've, never, I've never had a cod uh, on a crab, but you will get the smooth rounds. Rays, fish bait, you know, something, if you can pick up a few fresh mackerel, nice side of mackerel, absolutely ideal. Squid, squid is, is another very really versatile bait. You can buy a small packet or a pound box. What you tend to do, if you buy a pound box, leave it out, after a few hours, you'll be able to just pick those top few off, and then you can put them, they're still frozen virtually, but you just be able to pick them off, you can then bag them up, put them in the freezer and you can split that box into plenty of baits if you, if you do it that way. If you take that box out with you, you're probably on a day like this, unless you've got somewhere really cool to keep it. So also, uh, going back to sort of the, the black bream, what I found, a little tip here, there's a pattern of hook called a chinu, which is a really, really small, short shanked hook. Strong, really strong. I find them excellent. They really do get your, your hook up rates improved because black bream like little piranhas they, they've got a really good habit of of stripping your bait off in seconds and you see your rod tip go you know rattle 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 and then when it stops you know that's that's, you, that's all your bait gone um so those little chinu hooks with a pop-up bead often really really helps just gives you a little bit more movement on that bait can lift it up from the from the if there's crabs around it can it can help keep it out of their way not always I mean, believe it or not crabs can you know probably have a little bit of a, a, a velvet swimmers can certainly swim up to the bait so and there's plenty of them about one of the main fish that people want to catch of course is bass now it's probably the most 
common question I'm asked in, in the shop is, where can I catch a bass? And the honest answer to that is, well, everywhere, because they are all over the place. The harbour behind us is absolutely loaded with bass. Now, obviously there's size limits for bass, and also the, these are um, nursery areas. This harbour in particular, Langston, you're not allowed to actually target them. That said, once you're outside the, the nursery area, there's a, a small pier that I'm looking at right now that's just, just outside of the um, nursery area. There's plenty of nice bass around that. They like structure. They know where them small fish are hiding. That's what they're feeding on. And if you've got the patience, then you could potentially float a little live bait out um, on a float. You can even free line one, or you can try the lures. There's a myriad of lures, so many different varieties of them. I wouldn't, I wouldn't even entertain telling you which ones you should use because it's on the day often. It's, it's what matches what the fish are chasing. Not only that, um, it's the retrieve speed. Often people uh, you know, are retrieving too fast or too slow or uh, sometimes you've just got to get it exactly right. Well, on the subject of laws, what I've been using the last couple of years and uh, it's a couple of good friends of mine who, who have been doing it for a long, long time and they've put me over to it, are these slow jigs. Now they, they're something else. Now you can, the ones I've been using on wrecks, say 200 foot deep, have been a, a 200 gram huge, huge one. But you need that to drop down that distance to hit that wreck. And the way in which I, I work these slow jigs literally is to drop them down, hit the bottom, take a turn and lift. And the fish nearly always hit on the downward flutter. And they're designed that when they, you, you pull them up and as they, as they come down, they, they flutter and there's something about that movement that the fish don't seem to be able to resist. They, I mean, 200 gram, gram lure, say a slow jig is about so big, I've had pout this big on them. Yeah. They, just, they just can't resist hitting them. It must mimic a, a fish in distress and um, yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's a dog eat dog world out there. And uh, Would they work off a short way in a smaller size? Absolutely. I mean, they they go down to minimum sizes. What what you find is the real small ones. You can't have any real tide at the time you use them because it just takes them away. And you must use um, small main line again. Otherwise, there's an enormous amount of drag on line. It's surprising how much there is. So, so you would thinking of that if they're just a spinning outfit, they're only light. They won't need that shock leader, will they? Because that'll hinder their casting, will it? Yeah, absolutely. If if you if you Again, the small ones weigh so little that 20 pound line, or you know, if you're using 10 pound line, it's absolutely fine because because they, they don't weigh anything. And some of them you don't have to cast them. It's literally you, you drop them straight down. So if you're on a boat you're over a reef, say for instance, you literally drop it down. It's that fluttering action. Ras, ras go crazy. They hammer it. Yeah. So to finish, um, by all means, I'll work a Friday uh, costume angling. Um, pop in, see if I'm about. Coming for a chat, I'll always direct, put you in the right direction. Um, as I say, I, I know from working in the last few months, there was a lot of people that just want to take their kids fishing. So they want a little bit of guidance, a little bit of direction, um, and it helps because the one thing you want when you take kids out is you want them to catch because the attention span usually isn't great and, and they get bored quickly. Yeah. So you want them to catch quickly, and uh, by all means, pop in and uh, I will give you all the information I possibly can to help you help you catch a fish. Well, hopefully there's a few tips there that Wayne's given you. If you're on holiday, just summer holidays, and you want to catch something, you're a beginner, you maybe want to take your kids, try and think. Small hooks, small baits, maybe lighter leads, just try and catch something. Remember, small hooks can catch big fish. Now, a recent occurrence in the hot weather actually was a real eye-opener to me because I was laying in my garden pond which I just jet washed out and relayed with lilies. It was pff, allegedly 40 something degrees, actually registered 35 degrees driving along in my car. So hot, unbelievable, freaky weather. Where better to cool off than in your garden pond? I thought I'll get a still picture and Mike can put it up on Facebook. Just pretending to fish there, testing the shark one. I thought, I'll put the life jacket, what's known as PFDs, personal flotation devices on. I could just lay in there, you know, pretend I'm sort of 
chilling out. Well, <laughs> stupidly, thinking I would get a still from the video camera, which is what I wanted, I thought I'd just do a couple of shots like this, different poses, and I'll rock backwards and just lay there with my feet up. Well, within a few seconds, five to seven seconds, bang! I thought my right earlobe was going to implode. This happened. Even bust my shark float off. <laughs> you can see that was a real hoot, a real laugh. I thought, bang, bop, bang, what the is going on? But I've never had one of those inflate on me before. It got me thinking, do you know, I just put it on, and when I put it on, that is, I don't really know the actual all ins and outs of it. So if you go on to YouTube and look up if you are on the water a life jacket, for me, I just thought, you put a life jacket on, you're saved. End of. Well, no, you're not. You're only saved if you can reach land or somewhere safe, or indeed, if you stay afloat long enough for somebody to rescue you, don't you? And if I'm five miles out, I'm not going to swim five miles in. I certainly won't. So, a couple of tips I thought I'd just mention to you. Do please go online and look up different uh, uh, videos, if you like, if you're on the water or not, because... I never really realised how many different grades of life jacket there are. The two I've got here, okay, are the nice ones to wear and the not so nice ones to wear. And I watched one of the uh, tests on YouTube and one of the best ones was the cheaper, nice one, no, not itchy, scratchy, salt water, who wore it before me type of jacket. Oh yeah, actually it was one of the better turnouts, the basic one. I'll put it on and show you. Now, I'm sure why there's not many of us out there that enjoy putting these on. If you've been on a rental boat and you think, who the heck has worn this one before? Well, it's generally not being washed off, covered in salt water. But these ones that I've got here can be zipped up and should be zipped up. Otherwise, look, I can't get this one zipped up at the moment. You should zip it all up nice and tight like this. And then you've got an additional tie down the bottom here. You can just do an overhand bow, bow loop, don't knot it, because somebody's going to have to cut it to get it off you. But if this is just worn loose, it's just going to do this. And having watched these videos, the guy is right, or a couple of the guys, what happens if you're knocked out? Well, you're not going to be able to zip it up, and you could suddenly drift out of it, it comes off, and you drown. Not good news. But these ones, although uncomfortable to wear, appear from what I saw in the videos to tip you on your back. Some of the other ones, I'm going to call them sports ones, they seem to tip you on your face quite a lot, which is whether you're a swimmer or an unswimmer, if you're knocked out, you're cooked, you're going to drown. So check out these ones, even, especially kids, if they're uncomfortable, trust me, these things will keep you afloat, at least hopefully until somebody can come and get you out of it. There's various different types, various different makes available, but let's take a look at the other PFD. It's a much more comfortable one to wear. I'm trapped! So this one you see is just a dead basic one. No whistles, lights, bells or anything. But when I first got my boat, I got a couple of these. This one's a heavy handsome one. There's loads of makes out there. And it goes up and over like this. The main thing is, I've been told this several times to be honest, and I've, I've now, having had this altercation with one in my garden pond, can well see why. It clips like this, it's lovely, you're free, you know, you've got movement, you've got everything going for you there. So, you go in the water, if you're not knocked out, you've got the pull cord here to inflate it. I'll show you what they look like inside in a minute. You've got the pull cord to inflate it there. You've got it nice and comfortable and you've got it round the back like this. And you can fish while you can cast, you can do loads of stuff with it. But if you fall in the water, it's also got, if you're unconscious, an auto inflate. 
Now you saw mine auto inflate in the garden pond. Boom, boom. It worked, but this is what it turned into. This one's unused, as it were. That's why it exploded around my ears and made me think I was turning deaf. Now they get different grades on them. You can see just here. Check out, you know, all the different uh, weights you have, what age groups, that sort of thing. Are you doing, for instance, jet skiing, water, fast water sports, that type of thing? Now, years ago in Mauritius, younger man, of course, I was doing water skiing quite a bit, almost every day after marlin fishing, I'd come in, I'd be have a sun down and then go water skiing. And the first time I, I really had a go at it, I had just like polystyrene vest here. I hit the water so hard, it absolutely almost knocked me unconscious. This is no, no word of a lie. Um, that was in the northwest of the island, I won't say, because the people might not want to go water skiing there. Um, it just burst apart on me. And I can remember being stunned under the water. I couldn't see the boat. I put my hand up, I was just kicking to get the surface, and I had one square block the polystyrene I managed to put under my float under my throat here until the boat come to get me and then after that you know you learn oh there are different life jackets so this one on pulling the cord or on impact turns into that one now, obviously I can't put it back on but you can see look it comes with a nice reflective tape there and if you lay on your back, which is what you want, you've got a bit of reflective there, so anybody trying to spot you from a plane can see you there. Also, around here you have a whistle to attract attention. Again, these life the PFDs, as they call them, their personal flotation devices and life jackets in general are only good if they keep you up in the water for long enough for somebody to come and rescue you. So you've got a whistle. <coughs> Jesus age. How loud will it go, Graham? Are those with headphones? Oh! I play with that all day. So, this is inflated with the CO2 canister in here. Now, in here is what they call a bobbin. You can see there's the lever that will pull it to inflate this. But under there, I did look it up, and these bits are called, they call it a bobbin. But if you look on the bottom of it, it looks like, I think this one works on a, on a sort of dissolving capsule, if you like, on impact with water and takes several seconds to actually puncture that and explode. So you want to really basically look at all the service that you need on these. It also said these should be changed every three years. I think this one's older than three years. Thank God, if I was in a water situation, it would undoubtedly have saved my life because that canister still worked. I'm not going to tell you how many years old it is. It comes with this, a sort of little service, um, readable manual for automatic and everything. And you want to make sure you keep two cartridges. You want one to load with and keep a spare as well in your bow somewhere. It's probably no good keeping it at home, is it? You want to keep it preferably in the boat. So um, keep them in somewhere warm, uh, cool and dry, and then you can reload it. Like I'm gonna to have to get this one recharged, reloaded, and set up again. Now, if this does deflate, and I purposely left this one three days, because it was virtually exploding, I thought, I wonder how long that would keep you. So I would be afloat for say three days. Then it deflates when it comes with a manual um, cap here, which you can pop off. And you reverse round, it's got a little pip on the end there, and push it down in there. Yeah, all deflates. So if you are in a situation and it starts deflating, pop the cap off. It's got some non return valve, I'm going to call it there. Somebody else has said it's called something else, I call it a non return or one way valve. It goes click, pop when you blow into it. You can top up, put the cap back on. And if you're in the water, <clears throat> sort of tread water as well, and at least top your air up again, uh, as long as you've got air in your lungs to blow in there. So I thought that's worth knowing. And then you obviously, when you've recharged with a CO2 cylinder, you deflate and you follow the instructions 
so that it all folds up and it goes from that to a nice comfortable one. But I've never been in one of these where they went off bang, there you go, it did. It saved me in my garden pond and that's how comfortable they are. But just looking on the directions here, I thought that's all I need and I go 25 miles out to sea in a fast boat, 25 knots, screaming, you know, whatever, not all the time. And I thought, well, it'd be all right falling in the water. No, no, there's different impacts and sport levels of jackets you need to have. So you really need to research what type of sport you're doing. Are you just walking along a lake and you're going to fall in the canal or something? Or if you're in rougher environments, you need different grades. And it's got those down here. I'll just read them out to you. So just reading on the back of here, it says GB. A 50 EN393 jacket is for good swimmers only in sheltered waters with nearby help, not a life jacket. A 100 EN395 for use in sheltered waters, lakes, canals, stuff like that. 150 EN396 coastal and offshore fishing with foul weather clothing. Not suitable if heavy tools or equipment are carried. And what I've been using is, yes, a 150 EN396 for coastal and offshore waters, which is, well, how what's the offshore waters? 50 miles, I can't swim that far, but it might keep me alive until somebody can rescue me. Then you get to the other end of the scale. A 275 EN399 is for offshore shipping and industrial in extreme conditions. Compatible with heavy protective clothing, most survival suits and safety harnesses. So I guess you're talking on the verge of Coast Guards. But what it does say here is, life jackets reduce the risk of drowning, but they do not guarantee rescue. Well, I'm hoping that some of you out there might think twice, should I wear it, should I not wear it? Some people just say, oh, I'm not wearing a life jacket, you know, I can swim for five miles, or whatever. It's not the point, is it? What happens if you're stunned or you're knocked unconscious or something like that? Sometimes I don't wear one, I might forget, you know? I don't put them, if I go on a lake a lot of the time, I don't do it, but I should do, what well, I say I should do. So, there's a few tips for you. Now, something else I wanted to mention, well, We've had hot weather, we know we've had hot weather in the UK, but there's something called, they said it's coming, it's coming, it's, it's on the verge, brace yourself, everything's, Britons, brace yourself for the heat. I'll brace for 40 degrees. Look, it's just hot for God's sake, it's just hot. Brace yourself. So brace yourself for this new thing coming, it's called a pollen storm. I thought, what a load of old twaddle. Then the wife was outside, she said, oh my God, look across the fields. This is before they harvested it, when there was a lot of pollen. It was just clouds, immense clouds of this pollen. I managed to rush and get the camera, get you guys a few clips of, yes, the first pollen storm that GP has ever filmed.
Well, there you go, guys. Not a lot of fish in this one, but I thought it's a few tips in there. Wayne's put some bits and pieces out of a nice black bream from the shore. We talked about life jackets. Listen, if somebody wears one, falls in the water, and it saves their life, just one person, I figure that mentions it's, it's worth putting in. And that, I don't know what's going up in the next film. Hopefully, a nice fishy one. We'll see you guys next time. Don't forget to hit the subscribe button. TA Fishing TA Outdoors, you all know the score. And we'll see you in the next show.